Tony Campolo once said that mixing the church and the state is like mixing ice cream and manure. It doesn't do much to the manure, but it sure messes up the ice cream. I'm a firm believer in religious liberty. In fact, that's one of the things that Baptists added into the, our American experience. A firm believer in religious liberty and in the separation of church and state. But that doesn't mean that God takes no interest in the state, that he takes no interest in nations, and it doesn't mean that the church can't speak truth into the state. In fact, we can and we should. It doesn't mean, though, that anyone will listen. We're a nation and a people that traffic in lies. Lies from politicians, spin that hinders one's ability to see things as they really are, in an advertising industry that lies to us every day, promising happiness, significance, sensuality, and friends. If we will just purchase the right vehicle, wear the right makeup, clothes, and perfume, buy the latest computer, upgrade our phone, choose a certain diet, go get an abortion, gamble across the street at Oaklawn, buy a lottery ticket, eat at a cool restaurant, you get the picture. You get this all day, every day, pack of lies. It would be easy in this culture of lies to quit beating our head against the wall, retreat into our own Christian circle, and just talk among ourselves. It's tempting. Who's listening anyway, right? Well, Jewish author Elie Weissel told this story. A just man comes to Sodom hoping to save the city. He goes from street to street, from marketplace to marketplace, shouting, men and women, repent. What you are doing is wrong. It will kill you. It will destroy you. They laugh at him, but he goes on shouting until one day a child stops him. Mister, don't you see that it's useless? Yes, he replied. Then why do you go on? In the beginning, he says, I was convinced that I could change them. Now I go on shouting because I don't want them to change me. Amos was also a Jewish author, a writing prophet in the Old Testament, and Israel didn't listen much to him either, but he kept on preaching. I invite you this morning to open your Bible to Amos, one of the minor prophets, Amos chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, that's page 813 in the Pew Bible. Use the Pew Bible if you don't have a Bible with you, and if you don't own a Bible, feel free to take that home and let that be your Bible. Amos was not a professional prophet. He was a shepherd and a tree pruner in Tekoa, just south of Jerusalem in the mountain wilderness above the Dead Sea. Interesting that this is where God nurtured John the Baptist. And it's in this region that Jesus faced his temptations from Satan. Amos was minding his own business, doing his farm work, when God called that southern boy to go to the northern kingdom of Israel and to prophesy. God called and Amos went. He did his work in the 8th century B.C. Jeroboam II was king of Israel. He was determined to make Israel great again, and he was the most successful king in the north. Israel was enjoying a rare season of prosperity and prominence. But the country was a moral and spiritual wreck. The rich got richer. The poor got poorer. The rich oppressed the poor. The courts were corrupt. Injustice rampant. The prophets false. The priests uh, compromised. Immorality abounded. And worship was both insincere and idolatrous. Israel was unmoved by her sins. She'd grown too big for her, her britches. She assumed that there would be smooth sailing ahead. And why not? Israel had a decisive king, a capable military, strategic alliances, and a deep treasury. Who needs God when you got all that? It was party time for the well-to-do in Israel, and God called Amos to go be a party pooper. Amos saw a storm brewing in the north. He saw destruction exile in Israel's future he saw the wrath and judgment of God poured out on that nation and Amos preached what he saw hear just a little bit of his prophecy in the word of the Lord listen to this message you cows of Bashan who are on the hill of Samaria 
women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring us something to drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Look, the days are coming when you will be taken away with hooks, every last one of you with fish hooks. You will go through breaches in the wall, each woman straight ahead, and you will be driven along toward Harmon. This is the Lord's declaration. Come to Bethel and rebel. Rebel even more at Gilgal. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tents every three days. Offer leavened bread as a thank offering and loudly proclaim your free will offerings, for that is what you Israelites love to do. This is the Lord's declaration. I gave you absolutely nothing to eat in all your cities, a shortage of food in all your communities, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I also withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. I sent rain on one city, but no rain on another. One field received rain while a field with no rain withered. Two or three cities staggered to another city to drink water, but were not satisfied, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I struck you with blight and mildew. The locusts devoured your many gardens and vineyards, your fig trees and olive trees, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I sent plagues like those of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I caused the stench of your camp to fill your nostrils, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you did not return to me. This is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, Israel, this is what I will do to you. And since I will do that to you, Israel, prepare to meet your God. He is here, the one who forms the mountains, creates the wind, and reveals his thoughts to man, the one who makes the dawn out of darkness and strides on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of armies, is his name. Now, like most of the prophets, if we were going to sum up Amos with one word, it would be the word repent. Repent of oppressing the poor and crushing the needy while you bask in luxury and enjoy happy hour all day long. Repent of your phony worship, of believing that you can worship the one true God and your idols at the same time. Amos exposed the sins and called Israel to return to God or to face the consequences of destruction and exile when, as he said in the text, you will be taken away with hooks, every last one of you with fish hooks. What an image. God is love, God is patient, but sooner or later, if there is no repentance, God will judge and harshly. But in God's holy love, he can't help himself but to warn people in advance, to give people time to turn. He often does that by trickling judgment before the hammer falls. And every calamity that he sends has one message, turn from your sins and turn to God. As you heard in our text, across the years, God had sent trickling judgments upon Israel. They were already dealing with the consequences of their sins, but they paid no attention to them. Listen to the Lord through Amos. I gave you food shortages, but you didn't return to me. I gave rain in some places, drought in another, but you didn't return to me. I sent blight, mildew, and locusts to devour your crops, but you didn't return to me. I sent plagues and war. You could smell the rotting corpses, but you didn't return to me. I treated some of you like Sodom and Gomorrah, just snatching you from the fire, but you didn't return to me. 29 centuries later, it's easy for us to look at this and think, well, what's wrong with these people? Could God have written his judgment in any larger letters than these? How could they not get it? How could they not return to God? Well, three reasons come to mind that are just as true for 21st century America as they are for Israel in the 8th century B.C. First, we human beings have a short attention span. These judgments are a trickle, and they don't have the same impact on everyone. They came and they passed. There was a season of judgment followed by recovery, and people have a short memory about things like that. Pain makes us raise theological questions, but when the pain leaves, uh, the questions go with it. I can't count how many people I've ministered to across the years in their calamities who tell me 
hey, now God has my attention, and I'm going to change. Few change for long. I knew a man who was cleaning his gun. Didn't know it. It was loaded. Gun went off. Nearly lost an eye. Miracle, didn't lose his life. He had been marginal with God at best before his wound. But he told me when I saw him in the hospital, God saved my life. I could be dead. When I get out of this hospital, when I heal up, I'm going to be a brand new man. I'm going to serve God with everything in me. I'm going to be at church every time the doors are open. He got well. We never saw hiding or hair of him. We humans have short attention spans, short memories. This is true on a national level. Some of you in this room are old enough to remember the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Churches were full for a couple of weeks. Congressmen of both parties got together out in front of the Capitol. They were praying together. They were singing God Bless America together. They were pledging unity. And if you pass three cars on the road in those days, at least two of them had an American flag on their radio antenna or displayed somewhere prominently on their car. But you know, in about a month, things got back to normal. God was forgotten by most. Politics got nasty and divisive again, and citizens returned to thinking more about themselves than about the nation. Short attention spans, short memories, in spite of all of those we sent off to war. That's one reason why we miss God's call to repentance in calamities. Here's a second reason. We human beings are more concerned about ourselves than we are others. Israel in Amos' day was in this season of prosperity. Now, wealthy people can overcome financial setbacks more quickly than the poor. Wealthy people set national agendas. And once they quit feeling the pain, their own pain, they forget about the people who are still in pain, which means they set national agendas that benefit themselves. Thus, the Lord, speaking through Amos, called the wealthy into account for the way they mistreated the poor. Let me ask you, like I asked myself this week as I was working with this text, Have I done anything? Have I lifted one finger to help any of these people in our own state who've been ravaged by floods? Other than maybe write a check. And let me ask this question. Do I do anything about that security and humanitarian crisis at our southern border? Do I do anything about that except pontificate my views? Those things don't affect us directly And so most of us don't even think about what God might be up to in those calamities. Those are other people's problems, right? We're more concerned about ourselves than we are about others. So we miss how God might be calling all of us to repentance when a calamity doesn't impact us directly. And then a third reason we're slow to repent in calamity, our hearts are hard toward God. We human beings can be so into ourselves that we barely notice God. When faced with a national or a personal calamity, we may instinctively think first of God, but our minds don't linger there for long. Soon our thoughts go to the ways that they've been conditioned to go. Hey, we live in a world of germs and bacteria. People are going to get sick. Storms happen when, when cold fronts slam into hot, muggy air. Bad laws and a few greedy people, they cause financial crises and recessions. And enemies, well, they naturally want to do a sin. Now, those statements all have truth in them, but that alone is not satisfactory thinking for a Christian. A Christian asks, what is God trying to say to us in these calamities? When calamity strikes, some want to let God off the hook, fearful that if God is in any way connected with a calamity, that it's going to make God look bad. And that would be true if God were a sentimental grandfather, whose purpose is to make life as easy for us as possible, but the Bible knows nothing of a God like that. The God of the Bible is a holy God, a righteous God. He's full of mercy. He's slow to wrath, but he is not void of wrath. God judges sin. He'll judge it in time, and one day he will judge it for all eternity. God's holy love demands this. He is a sovereign God who, unlike many of our deist forefathers believe, doesn't just wind up creation and let it run its course with no interest or interference on his part 
God is involved in his world. God is in charge of his world. And whether it's human sin or germs or weather or Satan, whether those are at the source of such calamities, nothing, and I mean nothing, happens that doesn't pass the counsel of Almighty God. The witness of the Bible is that God judges nations in a variety of ways and through a variety of calamities. The good news, of course, is that since God is somehow involved in these calamities, these things are not capricious, and we can take hope that God will use them for a disciplining purpose, that God will use them for the good of a nation or for a, a people. He can use them as a megaphone to call us to repentance and faith before judgment falls in full. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God that Amos preached to Israel. Look at verse 13. He is the present God. He is the creator God who makes the mountains and the winds. He is the God who reveals himself to humankind, the one who can speak light into darkness, the God who strides across the earth and nobody can stop him and nobody can trip him up. This means that his knowledge is complete, his judgment's right, his love, a holy love that would rather save than destroy, would rather heal than wound, would rather bless than curse. But after God gives ample time to repent, and there's no repentance, God sends the wrath of his judgment. He is not to be trifled with, ignored, or mocked. Not by a king, not by a peasant, not by a nation. As Paul reminded the Galatians, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. God is the Lord. He is the God of armies. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God Amos preached to Israel. And that's the God I'm trying to preach to you today. God is still moving history towards its destination. The second, the awesome, glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. And God still judges nations in the process. Nations and empires, they rise and they fall. History is littered with them. And only a fool would think that our country is immune to the judgment of God. We are not ancient Israel. We are not God's chosen nation. God has blessed our nation. In his providence, he helped our nation come about. God has used our nation for so much good in this world but God does not love America more than he loves other nations. One thing you'll never hear in heaven. God saying to attending angels, tell the Ethiopian, the Russian, and the North Korean to be quiet. An American wants to talk with me. We have no special status with God. We are a sinful people. We're as sinful as any nation in the world, and in some ways we're worse because we have easy access to the Bible. We have a zillion churches. We have a freedom to share the gospel. We have a culture and a government that still hold vestiges of, the, of Bible morality and values. So as a nation, collectively, we could never say, I've never heard the gospel. I have no access to the gospel. And as Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is what? required we know the right we do the wrong we approve the wrong we are sinful people we sound much like those Paul describes in 2 Timothy 3 look at this text of scripture for a minute but know this hard times will come in the last days for people will be follow this lovers of self lovers of money boastful proud demeaning disobedient to parents ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid these people. We are these people. We sound much like that. And it's this underlying spirit of those things that leads to a nation that advocates abortion and infanticide. That leads to corporate greed and personal greed. 
that leads to a lack of will in our Congress, to a lack of will and courage to pass just and workable immigration legislation, to systemic racism in this white superiority, to the lust that feeds the pornography and entertainment industries, to self-serving politicians and corruption in government, to the breakdown of the family unit, to drug addictions, to limitless education, health care, and employment opportunities for the rich, and limited opportunities in those areas for the poor, to a government that entices its citizens to buy lottery tickets, or a community that thinks casinos are good for them, and to our unique brand of American arrogance that looks down our noses at all other nations. And sadly, the American church adds to the sin problem in our nation. Many historic denominations deciding to let the whims of prevailing culture, rather than the God-breathed, time-tested scriptures, determine their beliefs and their practices. Our own Southern Baptist Convention making news for sexual abuse, failure to report, attempts to cover up, treating victims like perpetrators. And sadly, it took the, a secular newspaper, the Houston Chronicles reporting in the last couple of years, to force us to deal with it. Many churches ignoring and abandoning the poor, neglecting the lost, so they can just squander all of their resources on themselves. And some churches trading their birthright in the kingdom of God for the pottage of nationalism, for uncritically hitching their wagon to a politician or a political party. And a growing celebrity pastor culture, you listen to some of them on podcasts, essentially elevating pastors to superstar pope status. And some of these pastors, God bless them, they're able to handle it. But too many others, we read the stories, believe their fan clubs, and they get so full of themselves, they start feeling entitled to their sins. They get caught, they crash, they burn, they throw mud on Jesus and the church. And of course, self-righteous smugness always finds its way into the church so that instead of loving our neighbor, we judge them, and instead of loving our enemies, we attack them. See, much of the American church looks more like the culture than the kingdom of God. Jesus would be right if he stormed into most American churches and said, you are a den of thieves and not a house of prayer for this nation and all nations. We're sinful people in a sinful nation. God notices. And across history, God has sent trickling judgments. Abraham Lincoln and many others were convinced that the Civil War, its destruction, and its aftermath was God's judgment on America for the horrendous sin of slavery. I think Lincoln was right. Was God judging our nation's greed coming out of the roaring 20s when the rich got richer and the poor got poor? Was God judging our nation's greed, our inattention to the poor through the Great Depression and through the Dust Bowl years of the 30s? And what about more recent events, the Great Recession just a few years back when so many lost so much? And how about terrorist attacks and endless war and record storms and floods? Are these God's trickling judgments, God's megaphone to call us to repentance and to faith? I think they are. Every calamity shouts, repent and turn to Jesus. And yet we could say of our nation what Amos preached to Israel, but you did not return to me, says the Lord. So where can America find hope? Well, while voting is the right thing to do, America is not going to find hope in a ballot box. Jeroboam II, Israel's greatest king, he made Israel great again, but a strong economy and a military, strong military cannot keep God's judgment from falling. And in the midst of Israel's best political years, Amos saw storm clouds brewing, he saw God's judgment on the horizon. America's hope is not in politicians. It's not in political parties. It's not in Washington, D.C. But we can find hope in other places. We can find hope in the remnant of true Jesus followers who seek to live a Christ-like life in our nation. You remember when God told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? 
Abraham pled to God for mercy. He began saying, if you find 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? Yes, I'll spare it for 50. What about 45? Would you spare? Yes, for down and down, they bartered and negotiated until Abraham said, if you could find 10 righteous people, would you spare the city? And God said, yes, for 10, I would spare it. He couldn't even find 10. God couldn't find 10. But there are so many more righteous people than that in our nation. And who knows, their presence could give America more time to repent. So, so there's hope there, and there's hope when the church is the church. Loving God, loving neighbor, serving the needs of people, obedient to the scriptures, a house of prayer for this nation and all nations, bold witnesses for Jesus and the community, inviting people to come and follow Jesus. The church and the nation, we are desperate for revival and awakening. This is not going to happen without prayer. We can do good things. We should do good things, but those things won't bring revival. We don't need our work so much as we need the work of God. A church on its knees is a force to be reckoned with. Prayer invites God to work. So will you pray fervently for revival in our nation? Will you pray like the house is on fire? Will you follow Jesus day by day? Will you do your part to make this church the, the church of Jesus Christ? A church like that, that gives America hope. And we can also find hope in the love of God who is slow to anger and full of mercy. A God who postpones judgment to give people time to repent. A God who's willing to send his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins, taking on himself God's wrath and God's deepest judgment so that we wouldn't have to. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead. He is our hope as individuals. He offers hope for any nation that will acknowledge him. As we read earlier in Psalm 33, happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he's chosen for his possession, we have hope in the love of God who slowed anger and full of mercy. But one day, one day if we don't repent, God will say enough. And judgment will fall, not in trickles, but in a tsunami, and nobody will confuse its source. God is calling us to repent of our sins, calling us to trust in Jesus Christ who died for our sins, who rose from the dead. America can find hope in Jesus. Aboard ship in Baltimore Harbor, during the War of 1812, Francis Scott Key watched the battle rage for Fort McHenry. Amidst the bombs bursting in air and the rockets' red glare, Key saw the bright, broad stripes and bright stars of the American flag waving over the fort. It inspired him. And across the years, that flag has inspired countless people in our nation and in the world. And the poem that Key wrote that night became our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. Well, here in 2019, I, I would tweak Key's words just a bit to make them Amos' words, to make them God's word to our nation. Oh, say can you repent. These words, this call, it matters and left unheeded, the trickles of judgment we've experienced over time, sooner or later, become an all-destroying flood. Because America is not immune to God's judgment. So repent, Christian. Repent, nation. Repent, church. Believe the gospel. And find salvation, life, and blessing in Jesus Christ our Lord.